Jesus actually died on the cross and was buried in Joseph's tomb. Before it can be established that Jesus really rose from the grave, it must be established that he actually died. The Quran declares that Jesus did not die on the cross, but that he feigned death. Some skeptics have adopted a swoon theory, wherein Jesus appeared dead, but revived later in the tomb. Along with this can be categorized the drug hypothesis that Jesus was only doped and appeared dead, but that he recovered later. Against any such view that Christ did not really die, the following evidence can be offered. 1. Jesus refused to take the common pain-killing drug offered crucifixion victims in Mark 15:23. He was later given only a small, non-intoxicating amount of some cheap wine to quench his thirst. There is no evidence that Jesus was drugged. Both the obvious agony and death cry do not benefit a man who's drugged. Number two, the heavy loss of blood indicated Jesus was dead. He had five wounds and was on the cross for nine, from nine in the morning until just before sunset. Number three, Jesus was heard to have uttered a death cry by those standing by. When pierced in his side by the soldiers, blood and water flowed out. And this is the indisputable medical sign of death, indicating that the red and white blood corp corpuscles had separated. Number five, the experienced Roman soldiers examined Jesus and pronounced him dead without even breaking his legs to has hasten death as their usual practice. Number six, Jesus was hurried, embalmed in about one pounds of spices and bandages and laid in a guarded tomb. Even if he had resuscitated, he could not have rolled back the heavy stone, overcome the guards, and escaped. Number seven. Further, Pilate inquired to make sure that Jesus was dead before he gave the body to Joseph of Arimathea. Number eight. After all this, if Jesus was somehow miraculously still alive, his appearance would have been more those of a resuscitated wretched man than a re resurrected and triumphant Savior. It would have scarcely have transformed the disciples, led to the conversion of thousands a few weeks later, or ultimately turned the world upside down. Number nine. The undisturbed appearance of the grave clothes appeared like an empty cocoon, in further indication that he was dead. Otherwise, why were the grave clothes undisturbed if they had not been a miraculous rising through them. If it was a mere physical resuscitation or revival of a swooned and drugged body, then Christ would have had to break out of the grave clothes, but since he simply rose through them, it would indicate that he was really dead and rose to a glorified body that could move through grave clothes as it could walk through closed doors. The cumulative, cumulative weight of the above evidence, particularly the firm medical evidence of the blood and water places the evidence for Christ's death beyond the shadow of a doubt. In fact, there is more evidence that Jesus died than there is that most important people from the ancient world ever lived. Jesus' body, Jesus bodily rose from the dead. There are many alternative explanations for the resurrection of Christ, but none of them satisfy the facts of the case. The only reasonable explanation for the missing body, the many appearances, the transformed disciples, and the amazing origin of the spread of Christianity is the bodily resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth from Joseph's tomb. A. Joseph did not remove the body. It is unreasonable to suppose that Joseph removed the body of Jesus. When could he have done it? If in the dark with torches he could have been seen, if in the morning at dawn the woman were already there. Further, what motive would Joseph have to remove the body? Certainly this was not to keep the disciples from stealing it, since Luke claims that he himself was a disciple of Christ. And if he were not a disciple, then he could have produced the body and squelched the false story of the resurrection. And furthermore, Joseph was a pious man and would not have removed the body on the Sabbath. See Luke 23. And by the next day, the guards were placed to the tomb, Matthew 27. What is more, where could Joseph have taken the body? 
It was never found, despite the fact that almost two months elapsed before the disciples began preaching the resurrection. This was plenty of time to expose the fraud, if it were one. The truth of the matter is that the character of Joseph, the anxiety of the Jewish leaders, and the inability of anyone to find any corpse of Jesus are strong negative arguments against the hypothesis. On top of this, there is the overwhelming positive evidence of many resurrected appearances of Christ. If Joseph stole the body, how can some ten different appearances to a total over 500 people be explained? B. Let's look at Roman or Jewish authorities did not remove the body of Jesus. The hypothesis that the authorities took the body is completely unattainable. If the authorities had the body, they could have easily produced it and disproven the Christian claims. This they would have been more than happy to do, as evidenced by the manner of the Christians were challenged and persecuted from the very beginning. Furthermore, it is ridiculous to suppose that the authorities took the body and then turned around and blamed the disciples for stealing it. The fact that the consistent attitude of authorities toward the disciples was one of the most resistant, not refutations, is a strong indication of the reality of the resurrection of Christ. Finally, neither does the view that the authorities took the body explain the many unquestionable appearances of Christ to hundreds of disciples. Well, let's look at the theory that the disciples did not steal the body by Jesus. Or steal the body of Jesus. Did the disciples steal the body of Jesus? The allegations that the disciples sold, stole the body of Christ is a der derogation of their character as honest men. It is also inconsistent with their inimaginable, inimaginative minds. They were not clever plotters. Even Sconfield looks to someone else to fit the clever plot thesis. The disciples were fearful men who had fled the scene for fear of being caught. Furthermore, the tomb was heavily guarded, and the story of the guards that the body was stolen is highly implausible since they were not reprimanded for falling asleep on duty. This hypothesis, if true, would make out the disciples to be the most pious frauds that ever lived. We would have to believe, contrary to phys psychological fact, that they died for when what they knew to be false, and that they were transformed from cowards to courageous men in a few weeks by a deceptive plot that enabled them to turn the known world upside down. It is hard it is hardly more miraculous to believe in the resurrection itself than to believe this highly unlikely hypothesis. Well, what about the theory that the women mistakenly went to the wrong tomb? No, the women did not mistake the tomb. Some have suggested that the women went to the wrong tomb while it was yet dark, and that, seeing it empty, they reported that Jesus had risen. This position, too, is untenable. If it was so dark, why was the gardener already working? If they went to the wrong tomb, why did not the authorities go to the right tomb, produce the body of Jesus, and disprove the disciples' claim? Further, why is it that Peter later, later made the same mistake in broad daylight? How is it that both the woman and Peter saw the empty grave clothes if they were the wrong tomb? And finally, how can we account for the numerous subsequent appearance of Christ to others in broad daylight over a 40-day span? Okay, what about the theory that says the tomb was never visited? It has been suggested that almost two months went by before the disciples proclaimed the resurrection and that their belief was based on spiritual appearances to them, but that no one ever really visited the tomb to verify the bodily resurrection. The hypothesis is contradicted by a host of facts, most of which have already been discussed. First of all, the Gospels clearly indicate that several people did visit the tomb at different times. Furthermore, the, repeat, the repeated bodily appearances of Christ belie this theory. In addition, if the disciples had not visited the tomb, the authorities could have done so and refuted the claim of the resurrection. But instead of refuting it, the authorities resisted it. Likewise, this theory would not account for the miraculous transformation of the disciples, nor for the conversation of the thousands of people in the very city in which occurred only a few weeks after it occurred. 
So after looking at the alternative explanations, the only plausible explanation of the data available is that Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, really died and was buried for three days in Joseph's tomb and miraculously came back to life again, permanently and bodily vacating the tomb. The physical or bodily nature of the resurrection is proven by the fact that Jesus was seen by over 500 people, that he claimed to have flesh and bones, and that he ate fish and proved he was physical, and that he challenged the doubters to look at his wounds, handle me, and see. Doubting Thomas was, was challenged, saying thus, put, my fi- put the fingers here and see my hands, put my hand and place it on my side. John, who recorded this event, wrote later of Christ, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked up on and touched with our hands. This life was made manifest. The repeated contact with the bodily Christ after the resurrection by ear, eye, and touch leaves only one conclusion. They were in physical contact with a bodily resurrected Jesus of Nazareth. We have already discussed elsewhere in the nature and number of the eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ. Get the book and see chapter 16. We will simply summarize the evidence here that places the experience beyond illusion, delusion, and reasonable doubt. 1. Jesus was seen by sufficient number of people, over 500, to verify reality of the event. 2. This was spread over a sufficiently long period of time, 